highs of 13 to 17 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Back, so we will be uh, back and forth to Ennis and Thurlis across the afternoon with updates from the hurling. In the meantime and throughout, we'll be looking at the Sunday papers. Delighted to say we have Cleena Foley, presenter of the Off the Bench podcast and journalist with us. Oh Sir, no, us. I'm delighted to be here because in normal circumstances I couldn't be here, as you said. I would actually be in Pierce Stadium this afternoon for the two, for, well, for the two live uh, Sunday game matches and the studio I know is based in Galway uh, because that's the second match. So yeah, I'm getting to do other things that I wouldn't normally have time for doing. Is it becoming a bit normalised to have your Sundays free and the time during the week free? It's well, yeah. This is the whole point that I'm saying to you. Uh, even though I've stopped doing what I've been doing forever, uh, is my Sunday free? Well, funnily enough, no. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> did you, as a matter of course, read the Sunday papers when you were? doing the TV, like was it part of the build-up or did you not have time? Or It was, yeah, yes and no is the answer to that. I'll give you a real Irish answer to that particular one. G- going into a Sunday, you would obviously be reading the papers all week long, kind of, you know, and looking at featured articles and all that kind of thing. On Sunday itself, you didn't have too much time to dwell on it because, you know, to crack yourself, you're in studio, you're getting ready, you have other things to be doing and all that, but you would touch on it. The papers would be there available for you and you might have a quick flick through it. Or, more importantly, the other guys, the panellists, would probably be reading it, probably reading their own stuff in it. But uh, <laughs> So, you know, if, if anything jumped out, you'd be aware of it. Yeah. But you wouldn't exactly have time to be sitting down there just kind of, you know, yeah. reading the papers with a cup of coffee <laughs> or anything like that. Yes, no, it's true. Well, I'll take you through the headlines. We're on our social channels as well on the radio if you want to tune in and watch us. Sunday Independent firstly then, and it's, well, Parnell Park last night, as you might imagine. Dublin deliver knockout blow, Galway out of the championship already in the hurling. And beneath that, another hurling story. Uh, Joachim Kelly here. Kelly gutted as Offaly fall further into hurling abyss. Offaly down to the third tier now yeah. of hurling, which is an incredible story. Back page of the Sunday World. Robbie Keane's featuring uh, today in a lot of the Sunday papers. Rob, I'll be here after Mick. So this was something he must have mentioned to the Sunday writers during the week when he was doing his uh, Euro 2020 ambassador press calling. And his contract with the FAI is longer than Mick McCarthy's. So he's not too sure what's going to happen when Stephen Kenny comes on board. But he says, the FAI want me to hang on. My contract is what it is. I'll be here. If they don't want me, no problem. So that's Rob, uh, Robbie Keane talking in the papers today. Back page of The Sun again. It's... Um, Wicked finish, that's uh, wicked as in Wexford, Kilkenny, Dublin through as Galway lose out and then beneath that job just for Rob, Keane stays after Mick again, it's that Robbie Keane revelation during the week that he's now going to stay on past Mick McCarthy with the FAI. The Mail on Sunday, Joe can't rescue Tribe, Canning Cavalry Charge comes up short as Dublin victory and Waterford, Kilkenny draw, dumps Galway out of championship, a picture there of Canning who came on in the second half and scored two points yesterday. And then more Robbie Keane at the bottom. Chasing English players winds me up, fumes Keane. He's talking here about uh, various players they've had to chase over the last while. We shouldn't be chasing people. That's what effing winds me up. They should want to play for us. If they don't, no problem. We should go and chase people. Why should we? We're effing Ireland. We've qualified in the last <laughs> few years for two Euros and the O2 World Cup. Didn't quite have the new, new chant on the terror says, come on, effing Ireland. <laughs> we are effing Ireland, says Robbie Keane. <laughs> Uh, man of Pogba, this is uh, Perez telling <coughs> Pogba he should stay at Manchester United, he reckons. Uh, the man up is a uh, pun in Man United. It's not really what Perez is saying, he's been much nicer about it in his actual comments, but he's saying Paul needs to repay United's faith and stay at Old Trafford. Sunday Times then, it's the hurling again, as you might imagine. Uh, triumph and despair, it's a great picture actually, full-time whistle. Galway players know they're in big trouble, Dublin players know their fate, they're delighted at Parnell Park. A triumph and despair. Dublin keep their championship hopes alive and end Galway's early after stunning victory. Keane, Bamford must want to play for Republic again. That's along the uh, We're Effing Ireland theme. And Abramovich, <laughs> uh, phone plea to Lampard to take Chelsea job. So it's looking very much now like Frank Lampard is going to take the uh, Chelsea job. You won't be surprised to hear that he told friends he is uh, slightly worried about taking the job given the uh, history of managers at the club, but he's received assurances from Abramovich that he will 100% be given two years. So I'm sure we'll all be picking that out in about eight months' time when Lampard's uh, sacked. But uh, Abramovich, a phone plea to Lampard to take the Chelsea job. It seems Abramovich getting on the phone to Frank Lampard has swung things. And then finally, uh, prize guy, this is Tanguay and Dobele who both are uh, Sari of Juventus now 
and Pochettino's Spurs are uh, chasing prize guy. Sarri's out to pull uh, Italian job on Poch. They are, are your back pages. I've been told to go to Jamesy O'Connor. I am in Ennis. Jamesy, what's the latest? Yeah, um, what a start, Joe. It's been uh, explosive, to say the least. Shane O'Donnell, a goal inside the first 30 seconds, just nonchalantly picked up a ball in the corner and waltzed his way in. Um, Ed McCarthy then, Tony Kelly got a ball. He started in the corner, and, uh, and it's on again. Oh, Tony! Um, brilliant score from the sideline, but he had an opportunity to slip O'Donnell in if he'd uh, if he if he'd taken it. Um, so here was a joy. Yeah, Aidan McCarthy's a one-one for Clare inside the opening minute, and then Aidan Walsh goes right through the heart of the Clare defence. Donald Tui stands up. Unbelievably, what should have buried it? I mean, he was probably, I know, no more than 10 yards out. Uh, rebound, whoever came to Patrick Horgan, of course, and he put it back into the back of the net. So, I mean, that, that all happened, Joe, inside the first two minutes. Cadigan is in on goal here now. He's popped it over. So, it's just end to end stuff. I mean, at the moment, that score from Cadigan uh, has reduced the deficit to one. Clare 1 4, Cork 1 3, and just under nine minutes gone, Joe. Brilliant wow, start. Okay, lively. Clare 1 4, Cork 1 3, very lively. Meanwhile, uh, Tipperary no score, Limerick two points, the latest from Central Stadium. Michael Lester and Cleena Foley here reviewing the Sunday papers. Your fellow mm. county men distraught there in Parnell Park, they knew they were in trouble. That picture alone says we are in big trouble here and then confirmation I'm sure yeah. came through. I mean the thing about it is, I have to say this, fair play to Dublin. I mean this is about winning a match I mm. suppose than losing it but c coming as I do from the Galway um, side of the fence if you like. If somebody said to me at the beginning of the championship that Galway would be out of the championship in the middle of June I thought you'd be having a laugh. Um, but clearly they weren't good enough and they weren't good enough last night. And you mentioned to bring it on Joe. That's fine. But if you've got to rely on as good as Joe Canning and as important as Joe Canning is, a fellow with one leg, mm. then you're really in trouble. But I was talking to Tina about this a little bit earlier on. And obviously it's the big story, the big sports story, amongst all the other big sports stories in the papers uh, this morning. But this is the one that's catching the headlines because it's the Dobbs, obviously, and it's a, it's a hurling victory as opposed to the footballers. And Jeannie Mac, they're getting in on the act as well. And, and, and they were so under strength. I mean, they were without yeah. their two first choice free takers. And I think Owen O'Donnell went off injured as well. It's an extraordinary mm. result given everything that that's, happened. That's exactly but it. the power of Conal Keeney. Mm -hmm. God in my eyes. I mean, just the man is a rock. What a player. Yeah. And getting him back and getting Danny, Danny Sutcliffe back. Sure. There are things. And also having a Galway man. Well, I was just going to say that. Who had so much inside. Two, yeah. two Galway connections. Had two, so much exactly, Kelly yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. But uh, obviously, there's going to be a fallout after this defeat for Galway. As I said, not just like they did last year, losing an All-Ireland final. OK, that can happen, and Limerick are better on the day. But as I said a moment ago, for Galway to be gone out of the Championship at this stage, there will be questions asked Plenty of soul again. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, Michal Dunne, who got out of there pretty quickly yesterday, so he didn't speak to many media. He's not I, I, widely I'm quoted not, today. I'm not no. surprised. Like I'd say he's furious. But anyway, of course he's furious. The other thing about this picture is the crowd in the background, and Parnell Park and Grands like it have their limitations, but geez, when they're full like this, they're great. And the scenes on the pitch afterwards yeah. were amazing. If you even go onto social media and look at the videos today, it's just sensational scenes on the oh, pitch absolutely. afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. As, yeah. as Joe said, I mean, the thing about it is, okay, places like Croke Park or Porky Cueve or whatever, th these are now great venues, but they're catering for a different kind of audience, whereas Parnell Park is the traditional kind of, this is in your face kind of stuff. And, yeah. uh, and there's a completely different atmosphere. And the, and the hurlers have such a thing about it, exactly. the size of it, the way they can use it. They do always use it they to do, their sure. advantage. Oh, they do, yeah. yeah. They were yeah. never never yeah. easily taken on It there. is a great, I mean, I, I, I used to hate, and I still don't particularly like Parnell Park as a journalist, because the, mm. the media facilities in it yeah. are virtually minimal. Yeah. But for for spectators, you are right. It's like Accusa Park. You're right on the action. It's brilliant. You're so close to yeah, it. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. <coughs> Loads of pieces to get to in the papers. Uh, Tommy Conlon flexes his muscles across uh, page six and seven of the Sunday Independent. He writes uh, brilliantly about the Leitrim team of 94 and does an interview with three of the players, including one of them being his own brother. Exactly. Uh, they lived in dread of being an early team, he opens, another early team from Leitrim. So when they look back at it now, the primary feeling is perhaps the most precious one of all peace of mind and that yeah. is the theme. Yeah, there was a, obviously it's a very interesting thing and you forget sometimes how long ago it was, 25, 25 years. years. Yeah. The reason that it features is because that Leitrim team from 25 years ago presented the crowd down on Galway before the Connacht final yeah. uh, today. So yeah. that, that is the context. Which is a great uh, touch. Does that yeah. happen with it? That doesn't happen with no, every Connacht No, it doesn't. It's, it's, as we, as we know, it team. happens in Croke Park on All-Ireland. But obviously, uh, other uh, places have been taking it up and they're doing that in Connacht uh, today. Um, but 
it's, it's just to, to revisit that time. And I remember actually going down, not just covering the matches with Leitrim at that time, but going down once or twice to Kells because some of the Leitrim players trained in Kells and going down and watching these guys and John O'Mahony involved. And of course, at that time, we didn't know John as well as we come to know him. We knew that he had been in Mayo and they got rid of him after uh, uh, losing in All-Ireland and that. But to see these guys and you're, you're half kind of saying to yourself, this is massive commitment, fair play. And the other half of you is thinking, are you wasting your time here, lads? Mm. <laughs> Turns out they weren't, of course, you know, in that particular year. But uh, it was a brilliant time to be around a county like Leitrim or, say, when Clare emerged as well, or Wexford and the Hurling in the mid-90s and that yeah. kind of thing, to just see the buzz in a county. That places like, say, a Kilkenny back in the day or whatever, they don't quite get that same thing for obvious reasons because they're more used to winning. So, yeah, it's, it's a good read. And for younger listeners, um, they, they won't have seen that scene of Declan That's Darcy fine. and the 95-year-old, what was he, um, Tom Gannon, the yeah. man who had been the man who lifted the cup, the, the two of them lifting the city. It was just such an emotional thing. That's right, yeah. Do you know what really interests me with this? I mean, it's a great read. We don't even have to tell people the details because if they go and read it, I think they'll really enjoy it even mm -hmm. if they're not from Leitrim. But what's really interesting, and there's a couple of things that are... One, O'Mahony's role, obviously, and just how seriously he took it and how he changed the whole culture. But PJ Carroll's mentioned as well, and, and you'll remember him, and yeah, just what a character he was, and he kind of laid the foundations because they made progress through the league, and PJ was a Cavan man, and whenever you'd ring him for an interview, you'd just, you'd, you'd leave the phone laughing because he always yeah, had yeah. some stories. Yeah. He was a real character. But what really interested me was that they talk about when they came in and had tea afterwards, after winning, and and suddenly all the air went out of it. And that yeah. very often happens with mm. a huge victory, where in the immediate afterwards, players just kind of, it, it, there's such an anti-climax yeah. for them, which I think is really interesting. But what they really talk about, and it reminded me of the Katie Taylor video, you know, where she goes into the room and all of the things that she's won are there, mm -hmm. and she keeps talking about the one medal, uh, she keeps talking about Rio. They talk about the following year and yeah, not yeah. following up on it. And I think that's really telling sure. and really interesting about sport. You know, that's something you've striven to all your life, you win it. And then the one that still stays in your mind is the one that got away or the one you lost. Yeah, that's, that is true. And, I'll and Tommy Bob, writes about Bob that Geldof, really well. Yeah, you know? Bob yeah. Geldof actually reflected on this. This is nothing to do with sport. But uh, Geldof's book from back in the day after the live aid and all that, the title of the book was, Is That It? Mm. You know, yeah. you've, achieved, you've achieved so much and then you think, all right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a common theme, isn't it? Of course it is, yeah. And they had a, they, um, O'Mani had a psychologist working with them, who, which I'd never really read about before, who was kind of a business guy, a guy called, a Scottish guy called Bill Cogan. Mm -hmm. Very interesting stuff on that and how mm -hmm. he changed their psychological attitude as well. There's loads of good stuff in it. The players interviewed, by the way, Pat Donoghue from Drum Riley, he played midfield, Pora yeah. Kenny from Drum Shambo, wing forward, and Liam Willie Conlon, who's mm -hmm. Tommy's, Tommy's brother. brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, more corner forward. As Tommy writes, I've known the first two for many years and the third for slightly longer, given he's my brother. Yeah. Uh, Donoghue was a guard at 26 years of age in 94. Kenny, a primary school principal, 24. Colin, a guard, was 29. And you see them pictured now 25 years later outside. Yeah. Uh, Priors, 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 famous Priors pub, uh, yeah. High Street. Yeah. So initially Tommy writes and sets the scene and then it's, um, I suppose, in the style of almost the Paul Kimmage. They all, you know, it's yeah. a, a verbal history of it almost. Or, and, sure, uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's lots of great bits and pieces in it. I suppose ultimately them believing they could do it was almost the initial challenge that we, little old Leitrim. Well, they, they, they say this in, in this um, article, the players that uh, Tommy Conlon is talking to, the, the, the culture with O'Mahony, and they mentioned this in it, mm. you didn't talk about, if you, if you said, if we if, win the match on yeah. Sunday, <laughs> you, know, you would get laramated. Yeah. You know, it was all the positivity and you know this is this is part of uh, the of course the psychology of sport and and when you win of course all the psychology is brilliant uh, but it obviously was in 1994 for Leitrim yeah yeah one of the really good stories is uh, Pat talking Pat Donahue where he says I remember Willie in 1990 that's Willie Conlon Tommy's brother here uh, Des Newton giving him a hard time in Hyde yeah. Park physically and some night after that we're having a few pints next day hung over down the down in yourself and your father said to you, he said, uh, he didn't want to see the, you back on a field unless your attitude was right and you were physically and mentally ready. Yeah. And Willie says, yeah, he said, you need to sort yourself out, Sonny. He didn't want to be looking on, said Pat, and seeing his son getting bullied around a field. So Willie went away and worked incredibly hard. Talks then about playing Roscommon again, marking Des again in the Hyde in 92. 
I got this ball headed straight for goal. Last second, he comes for a tackle. I flicked the ball off, kept going for Dez. Whatever way I met him, I met him with a shoulder down the front. I could feel him lifting off me. Down he went, he was out cold and he was lying there. And I leaned down to him and I said, you weren't fit for that, were you, you effer, you? <laughs> Tommy writes, Newton reportedly ended up with concussion and a broken jaw. Willie, and he played on. Played on, yeah. <laughs> so if you want to get a feel for this being different times, that's a pretty the good time. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And, and really interesting as well, Joe, I think, because um, uh, the amateur status of players and the fact that, you know, parents will say things to them, that fans, there's an instant here where fans come up and accuse them of not working oh, hard sure. enough yeah, as well. Yeah. All of that, that still happens in the GA well, and I think we forget yeah. that sometimes. The level of professionalism is such that the expectations on players now are even greater than ever and they'll still get in the neck and those Galway guys this week oh, will get it yeah, in the yeah, neck from yeah, people yeah, in, their people. Day, in their days of work and, and that is one of Babs, the challenges and the toughest things. Babs Keating back in the day, Babs had a saying that uh, the difference between yeah. winning and losing <laughs> was the difference between a clap in the back and a kick in the arse, which was about two foot. Yeah. 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 And by the way, I thought one interesting line it was, even, and it just shows how far ahead um, O'Mahony was and some mm -hmm. of his thinking was that um, uh, the Cranberries' uh, dreams was actually used by them as a team, as a, as a theme song back mm. then, way back, way before this. And he used every possible, he had Tommy Gorman from RTE doing, you know, yeah. putting together video clips of them in action and he just was well ahead of his time with yeah, a lot of stuff that, that he was I doing. When, I remember when O'Mahony was the manager of Galway, they were training down in Portumna. Uh, for one of the big matches yeah. and they went to Portumna because it's the hurling side of Galway so they were a little bit away from the hype as you said and all that kind of crack you know yeah. but they, the, the, the pitch that they had got for the training was not too far away from the hotel and John O'Mahony got the manager of the hotel who was a friend of mine to walk with them from the hotel door to the pitch so that he could time just how long there it took there you go not it's roughly 10 minutes or whatever it's just how does how long does this take exactly mm. you know so so that's that's the level yeah. and I'm that's the surprised level. that yeah. McGorry had success at driven as well and things it's, like that it seems this Leitrim team trained incredibly hard as well Willie Conlon calls Strand Hill the torture chamber. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so grim in nights when they're running up sand dunes that Jono, as they call him, would tell them to get in the huddle. Yeah. This is like penguins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the image is brilliant, <laughs> isn't get it? Get in the huddle at the top of the sand dunes because the weather was so grim. <laughs> and he was still sending them back down, but he, he was just saying exactly, that exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a great line in this as well about um, this, this psychologist, the first time they met him at the start of 92, 93, they walked into the Bush Hotel, I think it was, and, and he had a flip chart up and it was Welcome Leach from Call of Champions 1993 and obviously that didn't work out and then the following year we were back in the same room and there was the flip chart and Welcome Leach from Call of Champions 1994 and jo Joey turns around and whispers to me that's the do in a row. <laughs> <Pretty great line. laughs> that's a great line. Uh, you'll be glad to hear they meet up every Christmas the boys in 94. They're known, yeah. what does Tommy say, they're known as the, the 94s. 94s. Yeah. And it's great yeah, around Limerick. Yeah. Yeah. There's just, around it's just a lovely story I think about the fellowship of the J, you know, the mm. brotherhood that's there. Yeah. I mean we all love nostalgia but it was such a special time and the great thing as well was that everybody in the country was was delighted for oh them. sure of course I, yeah. absolutely yeah. That's, that's it like you 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 bring other you bring other tribes along with yeah, you yeah and other it's underdogs it's such as a well. novelty exactly yeah. i presume the 90s was your favorite era working in the sunday game because of both the football and the hurling that was I, every year it was my favorite era to yeah. be honest with you um but that was the 90s were special nice. for obvious reasons because mm. in both as you said in the early 90s was the football and derry in 91 and yeah. down and D so on Donegal, yeah. Donegal. Yeah. and then of course the hurling with wexford and clare and all that and of course awfully let's not forget them into yeah. the middle of it as well candy you know so but there was great because, characters i you know there was a real vibrancy but, about that well we like, used to get like into the dressing rooms afterwards oh, as yeah. well like i started working in the in the in 90 really from 90 yeah. onwards and as sports and in the GA, we got incredible access to players. I mean, we all say this still now. We look yeah. back nostalgically, but like you, you, do, you could ring them up at work and they'd give you an interview. And also, after games, you went into the dressing room. So you got such raw emotion after games. It, did, it was yeah. fantastic. Well, it was unique. You know, Nan at half time, we're going to do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> unbelievable. You got great yeah. bits like For that. For sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. that's exactly the point. Like, to do something like that. 1995, you're managing an all Ireland team at half time and to take the <laughs> trouble to do a quick interview with RTE or anybody at that stage, kind of, I can't see it happening now. To look into the camera and say yeah. it as well as yeah. he did. I remember back in the day, uh, Ireland were playing Luxembourg in a European Championship qualifier in Luxembourg. And I was there doing interviews and reports and the usual kind of stuff. And this was like, I've seen 
more exciting matches down the pitch in Captain Teeley and all that because it was real, it was real parish kind of stuff and whatever. But at one stage, I wanted to get Kevin Moran had come off in the second half, he was subbed in the second half, and I wanted to get Kevin at the end. So I, I'm kind of calling over to Kevin because I knew him. And he, the next thing he said to me, come here. Mm. So I go over and I sit on the bench with <laughs> the Irish squad and the subs and all that kind of stuff. And he's chatting about the match and he's going on about it, which was great that, that nobody had any bother with it until Jack turned around and he looked, who the hell are you? What are you doing there? <laughs> 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 and Michael Lester from RTE. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, we'll pause for a moment and check in with Tommy Welch, who's at Semple Stadium, Tipperary against Limerick. Eight points to five, is it, Tommy? In fact, another score now, 9 5 tip. Yeah, Jason Ford is just after putting them ahead. Um, the f- physic- It's nine points to five to Tipperary. The physicality is unbelievable here, Joe. Both sets of backs are on top. And whatever the f- whatever a forward, when he scores, he definitely earns it. Um, for Tipperary, the Bonner Mar is hurling out of his skin. Noel McGrath is dominating out around midfield. And the Tipperary half-back line, there's very little going past that Tipperary half-back line. of Brendan Maher, Rona Maher and Paddy Maher. And Paddy Maher even, and Brendan scored a pint deep. Each, uh, for good measure for Limerick really it's their backs their backs have been absolutely brilliant even though they've conceded nine points but that's due to the absolute brilliance of this Tipperary forward line we asked the question before the game what would it be like when there was massive intensity when they only had a second on the ball well that's happening to them here today the first ball Bubbles got he was put straight to the ground um, but they, they only need kind of half a yard and they just turn and, and straight over the bar there have been some magical scores Limerick had a chance of a goal Joe before I leave you he was uh, Seamus Flanagan was going in along the, the the old stand side here got in out to around the fourth 14 yard line and hit it low and came off the leg of, of Brian Hogan, the son of former Tipperary Grey Ken Hogan. So it's an absolute fabulous uh, game. It's nine points to six now, and the rain is pouring down here in Turles. Thanks, Tommy. 25 minutes gone, tip by three. James O'Connor and Ennis. I presume a similar amount of time gone there. James, are things as frenetic as they started? No, well, um, no, no, they couldn't be, Joe. Uh, that wouldn't be possible. I mean, two goals inside the first two minutes, um, but there's been plenty of incidents. Uh, Clare had a, another goal chance. It was a 21-metre free after, I think, just Shane O'Donnell had been kind of pulled down. And uh, Peter Douglas stood over it, went for goal. It was saved. O'Donnell had a little bite of the rebound. It just trickled wide. Uh, there was another incident then where um, I think Daniel Kearney um, was on the sideline with... Uh, with Cahill Malone the Clare player and there was a bit of a tackle and I think Kearney might have caught him with the hurley into the head the Clare management went ballistic the court management were down we had a little bit of a schmozzle so to speak Kearney I don't think it was any intent and picked up a yellow card Alan, or Owen Cadigan John, John Connan having some battle uh, wrestling match at times before the ball is in the air Cadigan has fouled Connan a couple of times um, he's on a yellow card uh, Aidan Walsh had the ball over the bar but had no helmet in the process uh, that had been I suppose he'd lost it in the course of a tackle or something. So there's been plenty of incident, plenty of drama. At the moment, though, Joe Clare have definitely had the better of the last 10 minutes. Um, they've, uh, they've, they were level at 1-5 apiece, but they got the last four scores. Uh, a great score from Cullen Galvin from the middle of the field and three Peter Duggan frees. And at the moment, Clare, four to the good, 1-9 to 1-5. They are playing whatever breeze is there, but they've been physical, they've been tough, they're up for it big time. The home crowd are into it, and uh, as the Cork know, they're in a match. OK, thanks very much, James O'Connor. Claire uh, showing some fight in Ennis. Back to the lads across the course of the afternoon. Seeing as we have the Sunday Independent to open in front of us, Paul Kimmage in conversation with Gareth Farley is a two-page spread as well. He's a fairly interesting and impressive person, Gareth Far- Farley. I think people are aware of his story and he's done various interviews and there's another two-page spread here. And uh, yeah, impressive, I think, is the main word. Yeah, it is. And it's one of those things that uh, somebody like Garrett, he, he's one of those guys you forget about over the years. Mm. Kind of, but in actual fact, when you go back, he played for Ireland, of course, he played for the Republic and a uh, professional footballer who suffered an aneurysm and various complications of all of that. And this is this is his story. And it's one of those. Uh, and there are a few of those actually in the weekend sports pages of people who have come through adversity and come out the other side of it and thankfully are in good shape, both physically and uh, and where they're at in life and all that kind of thing. There's one there's one nice line in this, by the way, of uh, Garrett's story. He um, he had 40% of his stomach removed, yeah. 20% of his spine, not sorry, sorry, uh, spine, yeah. pancreas, sorry, yeah. and uh, his entire spleen. His entire spleen. But um, the surgeon said to him, uh, do you believe in God? 
And he said, why? And he said, because uh, actually 90% of people die from that surgery. <laughs> so, mm. But uh, happily, he was one of the 10 that, that has come through the other end of it. Yeah, for you. It's, it's, it's one of those stories that it's, uh, as I said, you read it in fascination, kind of, as, as to the, the journey this guy was on. For younger listeners not aware of him, as Michael says, he played for Ireland, he scored the goal for Everton, Paul writes, to keep them up in the final day of the 1998 season. Mm -hmm. He scored the goal to earn Bolton promotion to the That's playoffs right. in a one, played for Ireland a full professional career, and then had to leave football behind because of this aneurysm and reinvents himself as a lawyer over in the UK. And the journey to doing that sure. ain't, ain't easy, and he talks at length about that. For a start, he's a 30, 31, 32-year-old, and he's told it's going to take you six years, which yeah. is a daunting thought, but he, of course. He, he went with it. That's the whole point. I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. It's, and it's a difficulty for professional sports people or professional soccer players and that kind of stuff to, to find what to do with themselves in afterlife and that. And then to, to find yourself suddenly put in that position. Most guys will, will creep up on it because they come to retirement mm. and they come to the point where football isn't viable anymore. But if you're suddenly faced with it, as happened in his case here, um, then and you suddenly say to yourself, okay, so what happens next in life? And that's that's what makes uh, a story like this so much more interesting. And, yeah. and uh, sorry, Joe, as is, as as is teased out in this as well. One of the interesting aspects, and uh, for me in this as well, is is when you're used to the lifestyle, and that's even the back yeah. then to see the amount of money that he was being paid, mm -hmm. um, twenty thousand a week and Bolton. with Bolton. He was yeah. embarrassed to say it as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and and Kimmich keeps pushing him on the fact that then he went on to become uh, uh, to become a lawyer and asked him about his first check, and he eventually gets it out of him, and his first check was. Was thirty six thousand a year, mm -hmm. and like we do forget about in how insane the money is in football, and how sometimes I think it's a miracle that anybody who's involved in that comes out as a normal human being. Know. Do you know what I mean? It yeah. takes such a such discipline because it is insane money. I mean, it, the, the thirty six thousand a year is still a brilliant salary for for anybody nowadays. Yeah. you know. Yeah. So I, you think about the money. He lost a lot of his money though. When he was That's very in interesting. This. I didn't oh, sure, know yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah there was yeah. this this um, investment scheme mm -hmm. that uh, that quite a few uh, hundreds of footballers apparently were mm -hmm. caught out mm -hmm. in it. They were investing in, um, it was a tax relief scheme that it was about, it was actually about making the British film yeah, industry. Right, and yeah. he lost a lot of money and he was, as you said, Michael, he was stuck then with this thing of, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? Yes. And how am I going to get money? And, and then the fact that he went to law, the whole fact that actually he takes a very unsentimental view of football and, yes, and yeah. says a lot of, you know, a lot of people working in football don't love football. So there's actually. no faith in football. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. What and kicked off the interest in law, by the way, is when he was Bohemian's manager, people might yeah. remember he was back. Yeah. And he said he had to meet a lot of lawyers, legal stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said that you meet the lawyer, you nod your head, you feign understanding and you realise I'm not worldly in the things I'm dealing with. And he says, and I didn't like it. And that was almost the first thought he had of doing something That's like right. this. Yeah, uh, and, and very interesting relationship, obviously, with his with this is his father, who's who. If I am right, right, and thinking yeah. his father is now. So there's a very interesting, you know, family dynamic going on there mm -hmm. as well. Um, it's a it's a good read, I think. It was very sad the family Absolutely. situation. Yeah, he talks about his parents losing a son, his brother, at just two years of age, mm. and the environment being very negative. Like I'm sure his parents were just utterly grief-stricken, as you can oh, imagine. Yeah. And his yeah. father never quite recovered, was fearful, and there was almost a, a negativity about what could go wrong. You can understand that psychology, yeah. I suppose. Of course yeah. Talks about having Brian Kidd in the house. Coming to the house, yeah. Saying, sign for Manchester United. And he said, but my dad was like, well, you can't sign for United. They don't give kids a chance. And he says, class of 92, that went well, didn't it? Yeah. Bang on with that one. <laughs> yeah, there's a great line that when yeah, he was saying yeah. it was like a Brendan O'Carroll sketch, the Hoover and the yeah. cleaning that was done at the house before Brian Kidd arrived as well. Yeah. So he had a complicated um, a complicated family history and a relationship with his dad, clearly. Yeah. Um, and that's very well teased out in it mm -hmm. as well. And that notion that um, back in those days, like you sent your child to, to England at 16 or 15 or whatever age they were, mm. And in, in, in some parents, his dad was an example of saying, you know, don't, don't, don't come home. You'll get homesick. Stay out there. You know, tough through it. And he and he struggled to toughen through those very, very tough days that he had in the beginning. He obviously worked with with somebody who really treated the players very badly in one club. Mm. And so it's all it's 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 a good uh, exposition, I think, of of the difficulties that young players still face. It I'm is, sure. and as he says himself, that his parents never understood football. 
yeah. and and that added to the challenge then as you said and the other aspects in in, in the family life and all that kind of thing but uh, there are ongoing allegations against Kevin McDonald at Aston Villa and he is still defending himself and that is ongoing but certainly mm. Gareth Farley's experience at Aston Villa and, and I think he's he's spoken about this before but um to say it was tough love would be an understatement. Yeah, it's yeah. real old school. Yeah, yeah. Shooting players down. Yeah, you, you think you're a player, you're not a player, and there was no sense of praising the players. It was a constant, relentless, you know, fights breaking out. Tough, tough, tough old sure. school love. Yeah. And he and he says, uh, it never it, it it stopped him from ever fulfilling his potential. Is, mm. is is kind of his core point. And other players at Aston Villa have come out and said, like it, you know, ruined my career ultimately. And and he talks about that very well. And it sounds grim. Now, Kevin McDonald's mm. going to defend himself, I suppose, and we have to let justice run its course. And Farley also then grim. also points out about the, the crew situation and says, you know, compared to what happened in crew, yeah. you know, it, I, I, my experience doesn't come close to anything like that. But he does say I, he didn't come out with a positive, positive memories. And yeah. uh, interesting now that, that in his legal work, um, he is involved with uh, mm. some, some aspects of football as well. Mm. So it's good probably to have that insider or knowledge of it. Smart cookie. Like, no, he, oh, yeah. he came out with this line at one point about all the Aston Villa stuff. He said, uh, for me it was a career of bad decisions based on bad programming and what my personality had become. That's why I never achieved my potential, but I'm actually okay with it now. It's a lot in that, you know. Mm. And, and good, um, fairly pertinent to, uh, comments as well um, about the Ireland situation yeah. and the FAI situation towards the very end of it as well. Sure, yeah. He has no sense in the FAI sorting the thing out, really, is his uh, point. Uh, he would be interested in being on a panel to get involved in sorting out Irish football. So um, that's a two-page spread. And, yeah, he's a very impressive fella, mm -hmm. Gareth Farley there, and, and talks about all sorts of things. So that's on page two and three of the uh, Sunday Independent. We're taking an ad break here, are we? We are. And we're told to take an ad break here. We'll be back in uh, just a moment. More from Cleena Foley and Michael Lester. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. All this week on News Talk, we're finding out how Ireland works. From working hours to what you eat for lunch, from pay to perks of the job, we're learning what life is really like for the 2.4 million workers in the country. See newstalk.com slash how Ireland works for more. How Ireland works, thanks to jobsireland.ie. Connecting employers and job seekers. All this week, only on News Talk. Satisfying afternoons with Harvey Norman. First time buyer? Wondering how to get everything done? Don't. Just sit back and watch your house become a home with Harvey Norman's delivery and install. Go, Harvey, go! A six month spa break. Breaking for lunch on time. Eating in triple Michelin star restaurants. Restaurants that serve your favourite childhood dinner. To live happily ever after. After work drinks on a Friday. To, to own an, an Audi. Audi. An Audi, Audi in my, my drive. drive. You know, sometimes the things you want and the things you can have are the same thing. So get down to your local Audi dealer and test drive the Audi you've always wanted in our 192 sales event today. Audi. Vorsprung durch Technik. Visit Audi Center Bracken Road Sandyford today to avail of our exclusive offers and test drive your future Audi. Right now, Burger King has an amazing deal. 10 chicken nuggets for €2.50. Euro That's 10 crispy nuggets for just €2.50. I mean, come on, what can you get for €2.50 these days? One of these things? <coughs> but do you really need that? Get 10 crispy chicken nuggets for just €2.50 only at Burger King. Offer available at participating restaurants for a limited time only. Little Johnny goes free, the twins go free, and the best mate from school who eats crayons, he goes free too. Because right now, when you bring the car to Britain with Irish ferries, a whole car full of kids travel for free. So pack in all the luggage and kids you like and enjoy a perfect family break in Britain. The kids go free with Irish ferries. But only if you book now at irishferries.com. Terms and conditions apply. Liam Gallagher. Live in concert with very special guest, Jerry Cinnamon. Irish Independent Park this Sunday. Tickets from $49.90 on sale now. Additional charges may apply. Subject to license. Don't miss Liam Gallagher live with special guest Jerry Cinnamon at Irish Independent Park this Sunday. Well played, Jimmy! In seven years, 
could be playing for Ireland. In seven years, she might get a tune out of it. Wherever the next seven years take you and your family, Kia will be with you all the way. The Kia seven-year warranty. Quality redefined. We've got great offers this week at your local Super Value. Like Super Value Kiwi Punnet, now 79 cent. Two for four euro on selected branded snacks like Nature Valley. And Gallo Family Sauvignon Blanc 75 CL, now 8 euro. It's got to be Super Value. Enjoy alcohol responsibly. So, how much do I owe you? Nothing. Hmm, sounds too good to be true. Here, take my watch. Really? You don't have to, sir. Uh, you drive a hard bargain. All right, then. My watch, uh, my hat, uh, and my lucky underpants. <gasps> take it or leave it. But, sir, it's free. What? Your PRSI contribution entitles you to a free eye test at Specsavers and glasses from our 59 euro range. Oh, I'd better put my clothes back on. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Welcome back. We're reviewing the Sunday Papers. We have Cleena Foley and Michael Lester here in studio. We'll check in, though, on the hurling first as they uh, touch on half-time. Jamesy O'Connor's down in Ennis. The latest, Jamesy? Clear 2-10. Cork 1-8. One, uh, one uh, Joe, yeah. I mean, listen, when I was last talking to you, um, Clare had, I think, gone 4 clear. Um, and then John Connolly got a fantastic point to, to, to increase that, that lead to five. And then we Alan Cadigan replied for Cork and we had just a sublime goal from Tony Kelly. Brilliant catch by Peter Duggan. Kelly running off his shoulder. Uh, credit to Duggan. He, he got the pass out. I was thought that look at you don't expect to beat Anthony Nash from there he struck it I think from just outside the, uh, the 14 but I mean top corner Nash didn't see it brilliant goal for Clare um, Jim Ryan got another point after that or what we thought was a point after that to, to, to put Clare what it looked like 2-11 to 1-6 but there was a bit of consultation and then it was wave wide and Cork have clawed the deficit back with two Pat Horgan frees in the last uh, the last couple of minutes so Clare in the driving seat 2 10 to 1-8 ahead um, five yellow cards in the match Joe uh Plenty of physicality, plenty of aggression, particularly from 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 Clare, which is what we needed, what we expected, and what we what, what we're getting. The rain has just started to come in the last five minutes, and it's 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 quite heavy now. Um, Clare have played with whatever breeze is there, and it appears to be stronger, um, you know, than what I than what I what I maybe believed initially. Pat Horgan um, has a three. He's missed three frees now. One of those was from you know deep inside his own half, but he's he certainly missed one that you wouldn't expect him to. Um, and Clare, look at it, probably got a lot of the matchups the matchups right. So they're five to the good, and as the home crowd, very very happy with what they've seen from the home side in, the, in this opening half. Thanks, Jamesy. Clare in uh, good form. So let's go to Semble Stadium. Tommy Welch is watching. Limerick and Tip players jog in. Tommy, how's it going? Hey, Joe, and Aaron Galan is just after scoring a free to bring the deficit down to four points. So it's Tipperary, 12 points, Limerick, 8 points. Since I was last talking to you, Joe, um, Barrett, um, Cahill Barrett in the corner went off with a leg injury over in the corner underneath the new stand. He went off after 33 minutes. Then, just before half time, uh, Bonner Marr was stretched off with a, what appears to be a, a bad leg injury, too. So, um, not all good for Tipperary regards the future and regards injuries, but on the pitch, they're absolutely savage hungry here today. And they really are look like a team that are mad to get into the, Linster, uh, the Munster final, even though they're already there. They look like the team that are fighting for their place. Seamus Callan has scored two beautiful points, and Jason Ford the same. Every one of Tipperary scores, they're getting they're get, their pot chances. The Limerick backs are putting them under fierce pressure but they're still putting them over the bar a great game here under terrible conditions and it's 12 points to 8 Tipperary in the lead Thanks Tommy we're here reviewing the papers with Michael Lester and Cleena Foley on the hurling team Cleena you were looking at a piece Dennis Walsh wrote about dare I say cynical play in hurling am I allowed to even don't use the even, word? Oh, don't even use that dirty <laughs> word Sacrilege Hurling hurling, um, uh, the hurling gods will come down on top of you yeah a really good piece like I, I like a Sunday paper to have strong opinions or analysis I think that's you know why, why you buy Sunday papers and read them um, and Dennis Rodge has a very good piece here on and the headline is officials hard calls on cynical challenges are for the greater good and he talks about a couple of instances last weekend um, the John Hanbury one um, Paul Murphy and Jerry Aylward and cards given out and just a very good read and he basically he says 
there have been multiple attempts to to change the um, to look at the cynicism mm -hmm. in hurling and maybe change the rules and tweak them, right? And and in in two thousand and five, there was a list of things that they were looking to take here, and he he lists them out: pulling down or tripping an opponent, body checking an opponent, bringing an arm or hurley around the neck, wrestling with the opponent on the ground, remonstrating with the referee, using the hurley in a careless manner. Um, he says apart from the, the wrestling on the ground and the behaviour towards the referee, all the others are still in play. And like, I, I know all the papers today saying what a wonderful game um, Wexford and Kilkenny was last night. It was an incredibly tight game, but I didn't think the hurling was brilliant in it. And I, st and I thought, unfortunately, there were a lot of fouls that weren't spotted or given. And I think, I, I know I've said this before, I have a theory that hurling needs two referees. But like, even we're just looking at a game here on the TV and watching that game today with Tip. And you can see guys, we can see it on screen, guys holding their opponents' mm -hmm. hurls under their arms and things. The referees just can't see because the game has got mm. so fast. I mean, that's <coughs> a testament to the players. That's brilliant. Yeah. But I do think he speaks a lot of sense here, and it does annoy me when you when to hear people say it because you see you see cynical hurling all the uh, cynical fouling all the time in hurling. I think at the You're, top level. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you in being in agreement with him because yeah. uh, he's pointing up something. This would always bug me in my time presenting the Sunday game, and that you would see things happen on the field, and you go to your panelists, and the, the attitude would be, oh, there wasn't an awful lot in that now, kind of you know, or as Cyril used to call it, handbags really, mm -hmm. kind of you know, and there would have been a flipping more than a match on, out on the pitch and all that. The, the, the ones asked last Sunday, we mentioned the Galway-Kilkenny uh, game where there were three players sent off and both camps afterwards were saying, now really, three players sent off, like how did that happen? Not yeah, for God's yeah. sake, how we're not that, even, we're not that even that going to play hurling. <laughs> you know, but if you, if you go back and analyse it, not to, to highlight one particular player, but let's say uh, Paul Murphy from Kilkenny, yeah. he got a yellow card. Yeah. After getting the yellow card, he committed another foul shortly after that that I thought should have been a yellow card, yeah. and then he committed another foul. To it. And the same for John Hanbury. It was a f John Hanbury, not that it makes any difference to him or Galway at the moment, but still, they know what they, this has been laid out that the, okay. the GA want to clamp down on these kind of things. So if you start swinging out of a fella's helmet or your arm around his neck or whatever the case may be, well, is it a surprise if you get a guard? Mm. And so, so and, and Dennis analyzes those as well, and does it, and and he looks at particularly saying the Paul Murphy one. Okay, you could argue that, um, or the yeah the Murphy one. He was saying you could argue that um, he couldn't get out of the way or whatever. But he was saying, but his point is exactly yours, which is he was already on a yellow card. He knew yeah. he was dicing with danger. Yeah. You know it, that's a thing. They just don't seem to. Sure. They just seem to like that. Yeah. Let him at it attitude, as he said. That yeah. let him let him go. And, and you know what? Um, the other thing is, if you talk to players in in the lower divisions in hurling. What really annoys them is that they, they feel their games aren't refereed like that. They feel their yeah. games are refereed much stricter than the top sure. divisions. That people yeah. are led away with things for the sake of the beauty of the game. But if they play like that, it's hauled up straight away. Straight away, yeah. There is definitely a culture of hurling fraternity, and, and that includes pundits want to see the game flow. That's yeah. the big thing. And they are far more likely to pull up a referee for st having a stop-start game than letting something a bit too physical sure. go. Yeah. That's just the tradition. And so that Cyril game last night, that yeah, game, Kilkenny Wexford last night was physical. There were hits going yeah. in he, everywhere. Uh, uh, Tommy, well, Tommy Welch was in the start of the show and I was in agreement with him and he was like, the referee had a good game and, you know, Mick Foley, going, Mick Foley says today, yeah. Mick Foley in the Sunday Times says, the game rep uh, resembles an episode of Robot Wars from the beginning. Both yeah. teams crashing head on and attempting to run over each other at every opportunity. But an engaging game unfolded and it did. It was, in, yeah. you know, it was incredibly exciting. But like apart from me, Adrian Mullen and Dee O'Keefe was brilliant. But was the hurling brilliant? No, it was constant. Rock, mm. rock, rock, mm. rock, rock. It was, it was, the yeah, it wasn't a great game. But Dennis is making the point of the Paul Murphy arms wrapping around the yeah. player in on goal. He said, in soccer or Gaelic football, that would simply be called cynicism. In hurling, however, labels such as that have a taboo status. Yeah, it's yeah. not often you would have a, had a hurling pundit sit beside you and say, cynical. Mm -hmm. And certainly not you can forget about him as a man. That didn't come up too often. It was, it, there wasn't a... Uh, you know, this was cynical play, this needs to be stamped out. Yeah, funnily enough, th this uh, addressing issues goes back a long way from the trial by television, if you want to call it that. When I started presenting the Sunday game first, and the panellists that we had back then, Eamon Cregan, for example, was very, very strong on players tapping down, on, you're going along with the hurl, and the ball is on the chopping. end of it. Chopping. Yeah, yeah. chopping, yeah. And we started to highlight that, and with the, the benefit of TV and slow motion and all that kind of thing. Oh, shippers, counties went lunatic, kind of, you know. We were 
trying to ruin the game. We were picking on them, of course, the usual sort of thing and all this kind of stuff, you know. So this is, this is, I suppose, as it is in life, it's an ongoing thing where you're constantly trying to address issues. But having said that, in other sports like soccer and rugby, we have seen where putting the rule to situations has only improved the game and made it better. Um, Cristiano Ronaldo wouldn't have survived too long on the pitch back in the 60s with some of the hatchet men that were around back in those days <laughs> and true, things like that, you know. Yeah. And and this, soccer went through the same thing. I sure, look, at if you can't kick a fella in the knee, sure, what's the point, Ken, if you know. But the game is, we believe, better for it now than it was yeah. because they actually did start to address some of these issues. Yeah. Well, and look. like Dennis loves hurling, well, I love hurling, we all love hurling. Mm. I just think that it hasn't become, has it become a game that's become very difficult to referee and if it is, well, what do you need to do about it? Well, and you, I don't you know put your finger on it and you, you mentioned it because of the speed of the game and the yeah. fitness of players these days. There is an argument for two referees. You know, no, I don't. I don't see what uh, what damage it I mean, could do. If, if, like, let's put it this way: American football, which goes at a much slower pace than obviously than hurling does, they have about twenty-five fellas and a hundred fellas on as well as looking three, at three videos three and, and yeah. <laughs> hockey has two. You know, there's a lot of games that are smaller spaces yeah. with a lot lot less players, and they have way more referees. Would you two leave Harlan alone now? Back off! <laughs> Back off! Harlan's doing just fine. Find your own corner. <laughs> So where do we go next then? Um, lots of different pieces. Interestingly, you were saying to uh, Neil outside, Michael, that you would always keep an eye out for O'Rourke and Spillane and the boys when you're, uh, for obvious reasons, I suppose. Sure. What, what are they saying today? What's catching your eye? I'm looking at Colm's uh, piece today and it's headlined, I hope I'm wrong, but new GEA committee looks a waste of time. This is another committee that has been set up by the GEA to, to look at aspects of the games. This one is called the Fixtures Calendar Review Task Force. And Colm is not convinced at all that any of this is going to work and that their work is going to be implemented or even taken heed of and so on. And he's questioning the whole, the whole notion of committees being asked to compile reports and then essentially nothing happening with them and nothing being done with them. And he, he referenced, this is as part of a, another uh, longer point that he's making, but in the middle of it he talks about, if I was John Costello, who's Dublin's CEO, uh, on this committee, I would play it cool, agree with everyone, and then hope nothing really too radical actually gets done. And I think that's the way a lot of people perhaps think about some of these committees, that they propose all kinds of, of worthwhile things, but what actually happens to them and where do they go next? Kind of. So that's, that's his theme. Um, in his column well, this week, anyway, he, he goes through basically every member of the committee. He does. He, yeah, there's and actually gives a his take on why that particular person isn't going to push for radical change. He starts off with Costello. He goes through, you know, John Prenty, mm. Secretary of the Can Connacht Council. I'd steer any discussion away from breaking up the provincial system. We're doing very nicely in Connacht. We'll keep it going. Same for the Ulster guy, you know, Ronan Sheehan, GPA. I'd keep it. You know, everything grand as yeah. long as the discussion about the internal workings of the GPA is off limits and he almost says everybody's going to look after their own little section. And look, and that's, that, is, that is politics and that applies to everything in life and is, of course it's going to apply to the, the politics of the GEA as it does to every other aspect of life. Uh, so what are we going to do about it? I don't know. They might surprise mm. him. They might read this and uh, surprise him, but uh, he's not too confident. Meanwhile, Pat Spillane is looking at Tyrone and saying they're a waste of time, really, this year. Yeah, I was just, um, I was looking at Pat's piece in uh, the Sunday World earlier on, and I was saying to myself, if Pat ever gives up the job with RTE and the punditry, or writing, obviously, in the Sunday World and all that kind of thing, but he, he would definitely get a career in writing epitaphs on headstones <laughs> because uh, he has dead and buried Tyrone at this stage in the middle of June or wherever we are. He says there is no way back for Mickey Hart after dire Donegal display and his beginning of his article is Tyrone's slim chance of winning the All-Ireland title this year have now disappeared mm. without trace. Mm. So people of Tyrone, don't bother going to the matches, don't bother saving up to buy the tickets, apparently you're gone. It's over. It's, it's over. Done. Yeah. That's in the uh, Sunday World. He's and saying historically, that. is that a good or bad thing when he writes you off? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> Ask Francie Bellew in our uh, <laughs> Pug football and all that jazz. Uh, Clean. There's coverage of the Women's World Cup. Yeah, there's lots of cover. I mean, what interests me, I suppose, is that um, there's so much soccer in the papers today. Mm. Uh, Robbie Keane has done very Robbie well. Robbie Keane has yeah, done yes. unbelievably yeah. well. I don't think I really need to ever hear from Robbie Keane again. Tina um, today show. has a bit of a bee in our bonnet about all of this. So I have to, <laughs> um, I have to advise. But, uh, and the one, the one thing that probably is worth analysing and, and is analysed uh, as a live element of it is Lampard and going to Chelsea mm. and what that means and whether he's able for it. So that's covered in a lot of papers as well. But I'm surprised at 
the lack of coverage of the Women's World Cup, given the, you know, there's decent crowds at it. Some of the football has been great. Some of the football has been terrible, just like every other soccer tournament. So there's some, um, I, I was surprised there isn't more of it, I suppose, because, it, you know, it is the only big life football that's on at mm. the moment. Um, so there's a good piece on Alex, Alex Morgan in the Sunday Indo. Rebecca Myers has a good piece in the Sunday Times. But I particularly like Ollie Hart's piece um, in the Mail. Ollie Holt, yeah. Uh, Ollie Holt, rather. And I think it's, be, it's simply because it's 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 what is um it's he just talks about really sort of some of the vitriol that's that you see online about women's football that makes you go, what is your problem if you don't want to watch it or you don't like yeah, it, sure. just don't yeah. bother. And he makes a really good point, which is his 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 angle is really if you love sport, you love sport. What does it matter who's playing it? You know. Mm -hmm. And he his his intro is brilliant. He says, I'm about to indulge in an epic bout of virtue signaling. I'm about to try hard to be liked. I'm about to labour diligently to appear woke. That's what some men hurl at anyone who writes or says anything that suggests is even a remote interest in the Women's World Cup. It's always men, often emoting in capital letters that sophisticated literary device of the impotent, which is a great open paragraph <laughs> in fairness. Um, and so, really good read, I think, you know, and he, he makes this very, the valid point, which is, um, you know, the the common refrain is um, uh, not merely that n merely not liking women's football does not make a man a misogynist, and that's true, right? What does make a man a misogynist is reacting to adenine comments about women's football match with a kind of ugly, frothing vitriol and mocking scorn. They would never aim at a men's football match, whatever the standard. And it's just that comparative thing is what I don't ever get. Mm -hmm. And so I like his angle in saying, you know, that he's seen good analysis, he's seen bad analysis, he's seen good plays, seen bad play. Um, but if you love if you love football, Paul, you watch it, you know, and you don't and you don't get upset about other people playing or talking about it. No, you <laughs> don't. But there is, is vitriol about everything online, is the thing. Oh, that's Adios, true. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Like, but some of it is shocking. Some of the but, stuff you see about women's football is really shocking. Yeah, but also in in the context of this World Cup and the American team at the moment, yeah. that is adding a certain amount of fuel to all of this is the case that the uh, ladies football in America are taken over the inequality of pay and all yeah. that. That's yeah. a different agenda, but it is now obviously uh, coming into play and into focus because of the World Cup is on and because the Americans obviously are uh, one of the favourites for it. Um, it features, the the, um, the Americans feature strongly in the papers actually this weekend and here in the Sunday Independent, poster girl refusing to back down, this as uh, you mentioned, um, Alex Morgan. Yeah. And this is after her celebration the other day and they were, they're making the point because they won the match 13 Yeah, it was a big, have, big argument yeah, about to, should they celebrate to do this, as a 13 yeah. I, Big, I, big I, celebration and all that. I've been hearing a lot about this all yeah. week yeah. and this morning I finally got around to on YouTube yes. looking at the celebrations right. yeah. and was really disappointed at just how subdued the celebrations were <laughs> in comparison to the way people have gone <laughs> oh on about God, this all week. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. Well, no, yeah. I it looked did, at it and thought they were I thought, okay. I thought the worm along the subs okay, bench for, yeah. thir for the 13th goal was a bit over the top but people forgetting that that? Or oh, they, they cut did. that out of the YouTube version? They did. The last uh, yes, goal yes, was they, okay, okay. she got the over and they did a worm thing along with the subs bench right. and that was OTT for me. But what a lot of people are forgetting is they were breaking records with a lot of those later goals. Uh, fifth, fifth goal, they were breaking records for men's and women's in oh, the sure. single game. Yeah. So yeah. there was a reason but for celebrating the 11th and the 12th, but I thought the 13th uh, there was, was a no, bit over the did, did, Fair <laughs> enough. It did get a reaction, obviously, as we've been talking about. And it has been described as the Americans being classless, clueless and lacking in decency and that came from the Canadians. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's a good piece isn't it Michael yeah. the Jim White because what his point is that of, of anybody who'd be liable to cause controversy, actually Alex Morgan is the least likely. She's mm, the poster girl the poster for everything girl. that's exactly. perfect yes, about you know, exactly. women's yeah. football and yeah, doesn't, yeah. doesn't stir up controversy and doesn't do any no, of that stuff. And as we all know, they're big into that in the States, kind of, you know, and that the image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. She scored five of the goals as well. So, you know, yeah. she was like, I couldn't, have, I couldn't <laughs> have dreamt of scoring five goals for my country in the World Cup. Why wouldn't I celebrate them, yeah. was her point. And I hadn't seen the celebration that you're describing for the 13th goal. That maybe does seem a little <laughs> open to, to be yeah. fair. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly on the case they're taking against the um, US Football Federation. Yes. I had always just assumed, well, the reason that you're not being paid as much as the men comes down to the basics of capitalism and economics here. You're obviously not generating as much money. Like there's a reason that a League of Ireland team is yes, not being paid. Exactly. What, yeah. uh, Chelsea players have been paid. Yeah. But Jim White in that piece says that um, the American women's complaint was that women were being paid a quarter of the men's salaries despite bringing in 20 million more, 20 million more in commercial revenue mm -hmm. every year. 
Yeah, there's a very complicated, I mean, it's yeah. a very complicated debate because um, there are different sort of bonuses paid and mm -hmm. everything. But that is one of their key points is that they make, they make, they bring in way more money to oh, the Oh, well, then it's a no-brainer. So that is, to me, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. no-brainer as yeah. well. Um, so that's why I think those yes. two pieces are good. And the Rebecca, Rebecca Myers piece are, is good in um, Stars and Gripes, is a great headline, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in uh, in the Sunday Times as well. Um, they are good. But, and they make the point that, like, also she's making the point about the celebrations and everything. It's like, the, the American women's squad is ruthless. Like, mm. to stay on it, it's ruthless. Yeah. And that it's the toughest place to survive. So anybody who survives uh, and makes the American women's team, um, given that they're you know, trying to trying to win back-to-back -back work, that it's one of the hardest teams. So, like, no yeah. wonder they celebrate it. That's the level they're at. And people who brought the gender thing in and said, oh, you you know, you wouldn't be given out if this was a men's team. But that, I, that completely conflated a completely different argument. It had nothing to do with that. I think it was just, it like, was. were the celebrations a little over the top? And um, and people had very people had different views on it. Mm. There was a match during the week, a men's match. I, that's actually gone out of my head who it was, but the, the scoring difference was 8-0. So, and this was the same day yeah. that the Americans in the, the Women's World Cup, and, that, and I think, well, okay, it is a bit of a thrashing as well, you know. So if you're making a point about the inequality of, of the standard yes, and all that thing, yeah. but I think for 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 women's soccer uh, on this global level now, and there is so much attention, obviously, to the World Cup. If if it's going to make progress, it has to do stuff like this. It has to get up there and get into the profile. And even if there's going to be a few bumps and a few mismatches, and like one of the points that's been made, I I coached women's soccer for a number of years, so I have a certain sympathy with where they're at and all that kind of thing. But one of the points that's been made, and it's made in this article here about uh, Alex um, Morgan, that the goalkeeper wasn't tall enough five to for touch, five. Five for five to touch yeah. the crossbar, you know. So, yeah. okay, look, that is fine, that is an issue, but steps, you take steps and okay, see where so it takes you. That's been an interesting point this week because um, I think her name's Emma Hayes. Emma Hayes, I'm speaking yeah, Chelsea, 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 Chelsea manager. manager. Yeah, well, Chelsea women's manager. Yeah, I thought she wrote, she wrote a really brilliant piece. I she wrote thought, a very recent piece, didn't she? It was in the very Times interesting. This week. It was very, yeah. it was very statistical. In fact, totally. Wrote, and yeah, her point yeah. was the goal sizes in women's football should be smaller. Because, because, yes. Frankly, for instance, and it was all stats all the way. And she used other sports examples as well. She said the basketball and women's basketball is smaller. Mm -hmm. But she said, look, it's this simple. The average height of a male in England is five foot nine. The average height of a female in England is five foot three. Mm -hmm. That's a starting point. Starting, That's an yeah. issue. Let's yeah. discuss this. Yeah, well, she uh, gives lots of stats, but the discussion seemed to be shut in very early. Yeah, and I've I've interviewed Em Hayes, and we've had I, I and I, I did a piece with her for the podcast last year. She's I yeah. mean you won't get anybody more radical about equality in football yes, for women. Sure. So it's a very radical idea she's come mm. up with, and again it was the reaction to it. And in these days everything has to be polarized. Sure. Nobody actually sat back and looked at what you were saying. And actually in this argument, and I I've had it sometimes even in women's GA is that the standard of goalkeeping isn't the same, but there are loads of reasons for it sometimes. Exactly, a lot yeah. of them are, they're yeah. not coached at the same level, mm -hmm. they don't get the same technical expertise. But also, if Emily watched the women's, um, the Argentina game, uh, England-Argentina game, the goalkeeper, the Argentinian goalkeeper was sensational. Mm -hmm. and Ollie Holt mentioned that actually. Brilliant, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Uh, Korea, oh, like, no, I think no, I don't think anyone's suggesting there's some like genetic reason women can't be good goalkeepers. No. So it's bound to be to it's do with the coaching. The, yeah. the, the goal size idea is an interesting one. I think it should be discussed, it should be trialled. Is the fear that it would somehow belittle the game and it would be like, oh, well, this is embarrassing for the game. For a start, I don't think to the naked eye a subtle change in the size of the goals would be all that noticeable. No, and I, and, and, uh, but the problem is, I think for women sometimes in sport, the problem is that when they're fighting for equal funding, equal development, you know, equal status and equal appreciation mm -hmm, of yeah. how much put work they put into it, anything that moves that back yeah. slightly, they're afraid that people will go, ah, oh, well, you're not good enough, so we have to make okay. the goal smaller the, for the you. Rules, tweak yeah, it. Yeah. So there is that little bit of a bit balance, and I think that's what women right. players themselves can be worried I, about. That when you fight so hard for something, oh, and that. then you have to roll back on it, you're afraid then that those people who are who are, you know, just not not sensible yeah. in their arguments are going to go even harder it's on it. Stick to beat you with. Of course, exactly. but the good news for women's sport is because we we all see that women's sport, particularly field games, be it soccer or Gaelic football or whatever, mm. uh, is beginning to, to flourish and to develop. And I remember a few years ago, I was down home, uh, down in Galway, the, the home place in Galway. The GA pitch in Kilwerden is across the road from, from our house in Barnajarig and that. And there was a bit of football going, I could hear the ball being thumped and I looked over and it was a women's football match, which is part of what the, the Kilwerden club is uh, these days. 
if you saw women playing football 30 years ago, you'd be wondering, like, what's going on here? And if you know what I mean. So there is, there is a slow, a slow, admittedly, oh, but think, there is yeah, a cultural think, change. Yeah. And uh, like every, every cultural change has to be allowed time, although some people get impatient about it, to breathe. Mm -hmm. And if tweaks need to be made, fine. Let's, let's see where it and goes. I think, I think this Women's World Cup, I've watched a lot of games mm. so far, and I really, there's been some brilliant skill in it, and there's been some terrible skill. Yeah. There's been tons of our controversies. They've been ridiculous penalties. So it's full of interest if you're a football Controversies fan. Controversies are great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, uh, very often I say that if, if people are, are arguing about your sport, that's always a great Oh, time. sure. If yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, and if they're so talking about you and around Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, don't worry too much about Alex Morgan. She earns three million a year in commercial endorsements, yes. 450 <laughs> grand a year for playing her football. Uh, Thailand, by America. the way, are uh, 34th in the FIFA rankings, the team that lost 13 <laughs> uh, 0. Five places above Chile, who the USA yeah, play today. Next, yeah. I hope USA smash them 15 0 and honestly do a conga for the 15th <laughs> goal. <laughs> and good Joe, on them. Calm down, I calm really down. Was, I was going to stick the two as, fingers up to as, as, as Bill O'Hurley used to say, okie dokie, we leave it there, so we'll see. I hope they go up to the Canadian press box and start dancing in front of them. 100%. Taxi for Joe. <laughs> good on him. Uh, am I getting a shout to do something? I am. Tommy Welsh, I've been told to go to you. Yes, it's 1.13 to Tipperary, 12 points to Limerick. The goal was a brilliant piece of skill. John McGrath won the ball over underneath the new stand, the Oreen stand, about tw the 21-yard line. Gave a lovely deft pass into the middle to Seamus Callan, who was kind of running in from the side. He took it on, still had an awful lot of work to do, and gave one of the Limerick defenders a little sidestep, little dummy, then still had work to do, Joe, and drop shot at it into the bottom right-hand corner past Nicky Quaid. And that was just after Nicky Quaid made a fabulous save, save from Bubbles out of wire. So there's all drama here, and it's now 1.14. Tipperary just after adding on another point. 1.14 to 12 points. Graham Mulcahy came on for Seamus Flanagan in half time, Joe, and his first three balls was an assist, a point, and then he won a free for another score. So his contribution in the first six minutes has been absolutely brilliant. The Limerick are just after scoring another pint, so it's pint for pint here. We'll finish here now after 42 minutes. Tipperary 114, Limerick 13 pints. Great stuff, thanks Tommy. Let's go to Ennis, James O'Connor for the latest. Yeah, Cork, great start to the second half, but before the ball was thrown in, Joe, uh, Damien Callan and Steve McDonnell um, on in the Cork full back line, and they dished out a bit of treatment to the to the clear uh, inside line. Shane O'Donnell in on goal, batting it. Brilliant save by Nash. Uh, oh, and... Cork managed to clear their lines but Cork the better start to the second half Joe as I said with McDonald and Tony Kelly uh, booked before uh <laughs> before the ball was actually thrown in to start that second half so the yellow card count uh, is rising Jason McCarthy picked up another yellow a minute ago but Cork yeah Pat Horgan a good point from play he followed up with a free Alan Cadigan got a point Dara Fitzgibbon got a point and Clare really struggling to get out of their their own half and win their own puck out but uh, they finally got on the board uh, a minute ago Peter Duggan slotted a free you know Donald had another goal chance there that he gnashed it really well to kind of save uh, when you know when Clare looked like they'd maybe um, you know we're about to swing the momentum, the momentum of the match back their way again but there's still a point to the good Mm. Um, the game's starting to settle down now but uh, hot and heavy Joe at physical and um, the tackle's going in yeah high stakes so Claire a point to the good as things stand about 44 minutes on the clock and Tip uh, just nudging into control of this game at Semple Stadium now um, page 64 of the Mail on Sunday we're here with Kleena Foley and Michael Lester looking at the Sunday papers I presume when Paddy Jackson first made his move back to London Irish he would have heard the initial uh, grumblings, to say the least, and hoped that might be it. And now over the last uh, month, and certainly week or so, things have stepped up a notch with uh, Diageo's decision to withdraw its sponsorship of London Irish. They've been involved with London Irish for a very long time, back since the 90s, their longest ever uh, sponsorship relationship. And they've decided to pull the plug over the Paddy Jackson signing a decision, they say, not consistent with our values. And Hugh Farrelly is writing a common piece here uh, Jackson has to serve as a deterrent for others, is Farley's um, take, or the headline anyway. He's been uh, writing about this for a while. So, I mean, that is the, that is the situation Paddy Jackson uh, finds himself in. Signing was always going to be a step one on the road to playing for London Irish and flourishing at London Irish, and he's now in the midst of not knowing how this thing is going to play out over the next number of months. Uh, the fans, I would presume, are planning something, or some mm -hmm. of the fans, I would presume, mm -hmm. are. 
Now, what's the gist of what Hugh Farrelly's uh, saying here, Cleena? Well, well, I suppose he, he, he's, talking, he's talking about the two sides of the argument, if you like. One is that there are plenty who, who believe that Jackson, acquitted on all counts at the Belfast rape trial last year, is the victim of a witch hunt, that he has suffered enough and deserved to move on with his career. That is one view. And then he's also saying there's a justifiable argument as well that it's a bit rich for a drinks company to be taking the high ground, given the negative connotations associated with their products. But that's not, you know, you could argue that's not their fault particularly, but there's bigger issues to play here. And he's saying um, clearly, uh, you know, it shows that, you know, corporate brands now look at look at players and, and are very conscious of image um, and ethics and that sort of thing now. And he actually says he he says that sympathy for the player should be tempered by the fact that his this situation um, uh, he talks about the WhatsApp, what was on the WhatsApp thing. His best move now would be to come out again in public show of contrition, expressing profound regret for his actions and accepting the price he's had to pay. And then he says um, uh, if, if he doesn't and is allowed to continue his career with London Wright on a salary uh, reputed to be around 500000 the deterrent is negligible. Um, so it's a general piece about you know how the London Irish really should have expected this backlash, if mm -hmm. you like, um, and, um, and, and, wh and what ha will happen next. I just thought it I just think that the uh, the Paddy Jackson, th this reaction to the signing by the sponsors is very interesting, I think, given um, just to compare it to Ascot. Um, there's some pieces in the paper today yeah. about Lester Piggott um, and uh, um, a statue, a statue mm -hmm. being put up to Lester Piggott. Um, and obviously there's no correlation in any way, shape or form. But Lester Piggott is somebody who served time in prison for um, a, a tax offences. Yeah. And it's just really interesting, isn't it, that um, on one on one hand, um, horse racing, you know, do that, recognise somebody, put their past behind them, and say that's okay. But in the modern era, in a different sport, and in a modern era, and in in a, in a, in a very different context, um, this controversy is ongoing. So it's just it's just showed to me how different sports can be and how different attitudes can be as well. It can be the, the the Paddy Jackson one is very difficult for obvious reasons because there's a legal aspect to this and it was a serious case and uh, trial and court and all the rest of it. So it's not a sports story. It involves sport, but there's there's another agenda to it and everybody recognises this. It and, is a sports story. Oh, no, yeah. it is. It, yeah. is, it involves sport, it involves but, sport, but it exactly. involves other aspects to it as well. But my favourite picture of all the sports pictures in the papers today, apart from Dublin celebrating, beating Galway and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. um, is that one that Cleena mentioned. It's the picture on page eight of the Sunday Times of Lester Pickett shaking hands with the Queen uh, earlier this month. And this was, uh, this is to, to flag up the fact that this statue is being unveiled to him uh, and so on. And I, I thought looking at the picture and there's obviously people of the same generation and smiling at each other and all that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, as you alluded to, like it wasn't, a, terrible long time ago that Lester indeed was guest of the Queen in one of her prisons and uh, and for for uh, tax dodging against Her Majesty's Revenue Commissioners. So a huge amount of interesting well, of like a over, fair few over, bob or yeah million, more than I have. Three, three million sterling back in nineteen eighty seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just an interest isn't it an interesting it's no, just an it's interesting very interesting. reflection of yeah. society. And, and also the voice that fans and people have now through social media. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think brands yeah. have never been so conscious of things like this because they are getting direct feedback from people. Direct feedback. And I have seen some awful stuff um, said online about Paddy Jackson as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Some very distasteful stuff that I, I abhor as well. Um, but I, I, I thought the WhatsApp stuff, you know, I would be mm. saying that stuff was just, you know, mm. awful stuff and, and horrible reflection of society, really, and some values in society. But it is interesting that, you know, all of this continues to whirl around um, and it's probably going to continue to whirl around him. Yes, it is. The yeah. case was just so yeah. high profile. I would say he's coming to the realisation he will never, ever, ever escape it for the rest of his career now. No, he won't. No, that's, that and is the truth. Yeah. He has been acquitted and, like, you know, the Lester Piggott picture is an example of somebody who's been to prison and society believes in some form of redemption or some offering of a second chance when you've actually been convicted of a crime and you've gone to yes, jail. Like, you've, yeah, you've been convicted yeah. of you put it to bed. dreadful. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. you've gone to jail and then yeah. there's a sense, well, okay, there's a freedom allowed now for you to continue with your life. And Paddy Jackson has been acquitted here and there is this well it's it's a twofold thing there is one it's about the whatsapp messages as opposed to about yeah. the acquittal and then i've heard other people make the argument as well that well this is a privileged position 
you know, this is like sport is not necessarily a right or, you know, should you be allowed to play on such a high pedestal? And I, I, I understand what they're saying mm. with that argument, but then where do those people draw the line? What's an acceptable job for Paddy Jackson to be allowed to do? Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't get that like, argument at it, all. And who decides no. that? Like, no. it, like, what is the job he's allowed to do? Is it... Yeah. A rugby player in the second division of France where yeah. he's out of sight, out of mind. He's is a it, professional rugby player, that's his yeah. job. If he gets so. paid 50 but, grand yeah, to play for London yeah. Irish, is that okay? Like, yeah. how do you... I, 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 that this, that this confuses is, me. How do you draw this, that line? Yeah. This is what I was saying to you a moment ago, that this is complex because of this background to it. I mean, the bottom line is, regardless of what you think or you might think or that might have happened or might not have happened or whatever, Paddy Jackson went to court the case was heard in front of a jury mm. and he was acquitted. Mm. From a legal point of view, end of. But of course, it's not end of because, well, I think the, because of who he is. Uh, well, I know, I think the what's happening. I, I think, think the what's happening no, I totally is, is yeah. oh, yes. what's it's, used it's, it's all the time. And it yeah. is what, what, what drives me stuff. to say, yeah. you know, uh, what a horrible, distasteful conversation for any young men to have. And mm. that's not acceptable. And I think also, for me, I think he made the mistake of not coming out immediately on the steps of that court and being immediately contrite about that conversation. And yeah. that's, that, that's what I think yes, has been yes, the problem. Yeah. But I do think there is a bit of witch hunter here because that's what social media does. Of course it is. And some I of mean, it is of course, awful yeah, stuff. Yeah. So it's you can't, uh, you, you, you know, you can't uh, condone that either. No, you, you know? no. certainly can't. But I don't I mean, know where his career is going to go because this is now he's still signed, and obviously London Irish have signed him. Mm -hmm, that's, um, mm -hmm. But the, there's no doubt that the controversy will continue to follow him oh, because sure. I think yeah. of the WhatsApp. I yeah, think I mean, that it, is, it will, and it'll keep is, is, uh, the, is the WhatsApp is the issue. Back up again. Yeah, it's yeah. not yeah. the acquittal. And people have mentioned that point that Stuart Oldin spoke himself outside the court and said he disagreed entirely with the. With the applicants, applicant is the word, isn't it? Sorry, we, we were all very au fait with the legal terminology at the time. The applicant's version of events, he said, I completely disagree with her version of events, but I apologise for the upset caused by that night. And that was and the, the gist of what he said. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas yeah. Paddy Jackson's lawyer spoke for him. Yes. And there was really no acceptance that this has been a traumatic thing for all concerned. I think it was about eight, nine days later when there was yes, a backlash. it was later. It was later. Was a statement release. He made statements. I mean, maybe I think he, he may have made even two statements since right. then. Or I made two statements mm -hmm. in the afternoon, but it was that he didn't do it at the time, I think, was a terrible It's mistake. hard to know what can he do. Like, does a soft no, soap is. interview where he, you know, maybe he needs to speak about... There's well, that's Hugh. That, uh, oh, that's Hugh Farley, and, you know, yeah, Hugh is a exactly, rugby writer, yeah. and steeped in rugby all his life, and that's Hugh's view is um, that he does say this, that maybe he he does need to do something at this point that would actually, you know, be, you know, reflect where he is mm. in his thinking and also, um, you know, yeah, I, maybe I, I know. explain to people where he feels he could maybe make some retribution for the 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 whole attitude mm -hmm. to women that was expressed. Or even, in that yeah, then the WhatsApp stuff, address yeah, that. WhatsApp yeah, but, yeah. But the thing so, about yeah. it is, like, you was right in the, the, the broad point that he makes about it, but because this is a legal issue, mm. And have no doubt, Paddy Jackson has been advised of Absolutely. what he should You're say so and what right. he shouldn't yeah. say and what yeah. he can yeah. say and what he can't say. And that's also a part of the, 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 the story and the agenda there. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. Absolutely I've, I've true. no doubt he's been told. And, uh, you know, why, what is the benefit of you saying anything here? But may, I, I wonder now, will it reach a point where, given this backlash, the people advising him might say, we just have to address this in some way. I mean, it remains to be well, seen. See. It's a, exactly. It's yeah. tricky for all concerned. Yes, and I'm sure, there, I'm sure he has an agent and I'm that. sure they're ah, looking at it. Yep. How do sports stars who become persona non grata, how is it that they, that they you know, um, turn that around yes. in, in a meaningful way? Rehabilitate yeah, themselves in, the, in, a meaning, yeah. in a meaningful way. And I dare say the WhatsApp messages of professional sports people across the globe if they were published and uh, you know perused through in the same way, not just sports people should look at well, it. Well, oh, yes, no, it's exactly. true. Yeah. Exactly. It's true. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Uh, Declan Kidney will have to kind of handle all this as well. The last thing he'll want to be dealing with yeah. in press. Yes, of course. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Other aspect yeah. of this. So, mm -hmm. uh, I would think in the next month or, or two, this thing is um, is going to blow up again. So uh, that's on page uh, sixty four, the Mail on Sunday. Lester Piggott in the Sunday Times, mm -hmm. uh, very friendly by the way. A uh, smile between the that's Queen and Lester yeah, Piggott. Yeah. They're in good terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Send a few Bob. Yeah, that's her. Yeah. Here's an amazing thing. I mean, if you're looking at uh, that picture of the Queen and Lester Piggott and you're talking about longevity, we all know about the Queen. Uh, Lester Piggott rode uh, his first um, royal meeting winner yeah. as a 16 year old in Wokingham in 1952 when Winston Churchill was in number 10, and I suppose the Queen was uh, the Queen as well. 
and then rode his last uh, winner in uh, College Chapel in 1993. Yeah. On College Chapel in 1993. His so record is extraordinary. Is that 52 is, to 93. Is it Bruff yeah. Spot? Is it Bruff? Who's writing it? Oh, is that Scott Bruff Scott's writing yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Amazing. I mean, just if you t it's a good piece in terms of the, the depth of his talent and the length of his talent. And there's a great story in it as well about him driving a car with him one day as well. It's a very good piece as well. Yeah. 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 Because he was a man of very little words. Uh, a few always, words, uh, yes. Yeah. Succinct, I think, is the word. <laughs> yeah. uh, where else do we want to? touch on, we've kind of got through the gist of it. Is as, it? as a Manchester United fan, I suppose my eye is always caught by anything that mentions Man U. Um, now, I totally accept this is the city season in sport generally, I suppose, but uh, definitely in football. So um, people are writing about it. But the one thing about it is um, Robert Pires says, this is the French, French legend, of course, um, that Pogba needs to man up Pogba, is what the headline says in the uh, Sunday Mirror. Mm. And what he, his point is, what Pierre's point is, that Manchester United paid £89 million for this guy. They did it because, and he was a former United player before uh, he went off. Mm. So he, he's saying, they put this kind of faith in you, they've paid this kind of money for you, you need to show them something and not be farting around the field uh, as you've been doing for the, most of the season. And like, I think for most people who would be saying, OK, where is he going next? Is he going to Paris Saint-Germain? Is he going to be back to Juventus? Whatever the case may be. Paris is saying, listen, buddy, do you know what you should do? Knuckle down, roll up your sleeves and do something for the club that is actually paying a big money. But will it happen? I can feel the angry Man United fan. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Gareth Farley's piece. Is it, is it Perez saying this or is it Michael Lester? <laughs> 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 well, there's the Gareth Farley piece. But, you know, he's quite, he was quite strong in it and saying, you know, nowadays players are just, it's about their contract, it's about their next contract. He's very, oh, he's sure. very unsentimental yeah. about yeah. loyalty but to clubs maybe, and anything maybe else. We're getting, maybe we're getting to the point where we should actually, <coughs> or cl clubs should just put out the agents to play instead of the players. <laughs> you know, they might get more uh, interesting fare out of it. You, could, you couldn't get further from, from football ah, agents, yeah, even, so though it's a, even though it's yeah. a football story, Joe, than um, a really good piece by Mark Gallagher, who I always say is such yeah. a lovely writer in the Mail on Sunday, about a guy called Connor Devine. I'd never heard of him before. And just to say that, by the way, because that struck me reading this, like it's a really great piece. We'll pick through the main points now, but like for Mark Gallagher to find this, I haven't seen this anywhere yeah, else. Yeah, I've never, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the hook, I guess, is that Iron Man, which is this huge, huge yes. global... Um, I, I, like it's a behemoth now and it, like watched all over the world and there'll be 3,000 competitors in y'all this Cork Ironman yeah. yep, is coming to Cork this next, weekend yeah next Sunday and yeah. there's a competitor who won't be up the front but who's probably as remarkable as anyone there yeah uh, and and I mean um, endurance sport you know always throws up fantastic human mm -hmm. interest stories but this guy is, is Connor Devine and he's a guy from Tyrone and he played he was a talented Gaelic footballer and a soccer player mm -hmm. and he played in Milk Cup anybody knows how he played yeah. in Milk Cup tournaments he played actually. Uh, he played with Glenavon in 2001, Sorry. 2002, um, and he was a. D he, um, he uh, yeah, so he, and he played he played Ga with um, UUJ in Jordan's so He was a good footballer, but um, he discovered um, in 2007, 2007, I think it was on the his 30th birthday that he had multiple cirrhosis, mm -hmm. and um, this is about how he has. Um, you know, dealt with that. Yes. Found um, found health again, if you like, and come back. And now, and and his it'll be the third time he does um, an Ironman. And like Ironman, you did it. You were involved in triathlon yesterday. But Ironmans are the you know, like they, these are the big beasts. It's mm -hmm. two point four million, uh, f two two point four mile swim, uh, one hundred and twelve cycle, and a full marathon. Yeah. I, I, I literally can't even comprehend. Yeah. But Two the other, point, the other I, point. I, I swam 800 metres yesterday and couldn't yeah. breathe. How are you feeling, Joe? I'm sore all over. <laughs> this guy's doing a 2.4 mile swim and then a 112 mile cycle. The lads did a 20 uh, mile cycle yesterday. Yeah. Um, and a full marathon. 20 kilometres, actually. And then a marathon run to finish. Yeah. Full marathon, yeah. 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 And look, that's and, and, incomprehensible. And, he, and he's obviously, he's speaking about this as well in the context of, you know, inspiring other people who have MS. I, I wrote a piece back in 2016 about um, the Wexford Camogie player, Kira Story, who, mm -hmm. who again was diagnosed right. with MS and how sensational she was. She played every single league and championship match that mm -hmm. year and was brilliant that year for Wexford uh, uh, with the same, with the same uh, illness. Yeah. So um, it's a really interesting piece. It is, and to put into context uh, with the Conor Devine story in the paper today is that 25% of those um, who get the who get multiple sclerosis, 25% mm. of them are in a wheelchair within 10 years. Yeah. So that puts his his journey 
and what he's doing really in the context. Really serious neurological illness. And oh, yeah. um, so he talks about how, how he did it. Um, he came across the US, um, Montel Williams, the US chat show host, which I didn't know that. Um, he has he lives with MS. And mm -hmm. um, so he was one of the people that he saw in the early things. And thought, oh, hold on. And actually now he doesn't take medication or anything. That was and he extraordinary, actually yes. seems yeah. to have um, uh, to be coping without um, yeah. Um, yeah. medicine, which Keeps is very... Keeps fit, plant-based di based diet. Yeah, and completely plant-based. He's yeah. off all medication. It does, I mean, brutal thing to be 30 years old and told this, and as you said, the 25% chance you'll be in a wheelchair. Yes. It was a nightmare. I knew that I wouldn't be able to play football again. It's a dream stealer. It literally takes away all the dreams you had for your life. You end up in a dark place. It's crushing. You have all these goals. And he says, will I be able to walk? What's going to happen to your family? And then the line was, it's a grieving process. You have to go through it. It took me four years to come out of it. And then, as you said, Kleena talked about very few people with MS out there publicly as role models. He's a single parent, I think, mm -hmm. of two children as well. I mean, seems mm -hmm. to be an amazing kind of a guy. And I always say with these things, look, what, what works for one person doesn't necessarily course, work yes. for another. Yeah, we always we're have not to recommending you to yeah, stop yeah, taking you, your medication. Yeah, exactly. You always have to say actually, that. Yes. Yeah. But um, uh, it just, I mean, and it's, as I said, it's his third one. He, he did his first one in Mallorca and said that was, you know, the, the, and he couldn't swim. He wasn't a swimmer at all. And uh, yeah. with triathlon, usually any triathlon, swimming is usually the harder part for people because yes, most people I run a cycle. So. I think yeah, so. I think obviously. Ah, no, clearly, 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 you've proved that. But he couldn't swim more than 20 meters in 2014, know, and he took lessons and watched YouTube, um, and then gradually worked his way. Yeah, and the show the power like your mind, power, you know, power because of he just would have been told by everyone, no, it's not for you. You just shouldn't go down this power path. Power of some people's minds. Is yeah, power of some people's minds. What amazes exactly me it, always. It truly is. Yeah, yeah. It really yeah. amazes me. Yeah, that's on page 62 and three of um, the Mail on Sunday. Be looking out for him next week around y'all and see how yeah, it goes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, as, as we said, the fact that he's there is mm. the achievement, I, mm. I think, is, is, is the, the whole point about that. Yeah, again, 2.4 mile swim, then he will cycle 112 miles, and then he'll run a marathon with MS. And, and over he's the living last, with MS, yeah. Living with MS. Yeah. 10 years or so, so uh, good on him. It'll bring 10,000 visitors into y'all, by the way. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge. Uh, I mean, it's a huge thing. Uh, the reality with triathlon is they can't, they can't cope with the numbers of people who want to do want triathlons. To, yeah. You know, they have to cut them off, and it's just a growing sport, and it's part of this growing, I suppose, revolution of sport, which is social sport as opposed to hugely competitive sport. That's right. Sport yeah. where you're competing with yourself all the time. Well, I have exactly. to say, yeah. What a yeah. fight he's had. Yeah. Yesterday in Dunmore, I really did see the appeal of the social side of things because everybody, it's very collegiate and supportive, and you don't really get the sense you're racing against people it's more we're all in this together sure that's it yeah there's a level of volunteerism that makes the whole thing possible and those people are brilliant as well and then afterwards everybody was at Dunmore East Golf Club mm -hmm. that's where the finishing line yes. was beautiful, beautiful view out there the gorgeous beautiful spot view. across to Wexford yeah. endorphins are pumping and there's a uh, Free pasta for everyone, and there's like there's a kids race then at two o'clock, and everybody's sitting around for the presentation, having a few drinks. I'd like it's not it's not kind of fitness freaks. Everyone's having a pint of Guinness afterwards. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, there's sausage sandwiches yeah, going yeah, around yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. And yeah. uh, I thought, you know, it's not the worst way in the world to spend. And that's a day. why that's why fun running and marathon running. That's why that's why they're such powerful movements. Mm. They're, they are, and also because, as, as you were saying, they're ones that get the community involved. 100%. And yeah. that's the beauty of it. It's not just the sport that you were doing or the activity that you were doing, but it, it kind of resonates in the broader community. And that's that's also fantastic. As the you best, say, best of the country, really. It like, is. It, you it know, is, community yeah. and everything. It was sure, really good. Yeah. Because I don't think they can do it without the community cooperation. It's no, and the volunteers never get any credit, no. apart from people clapping them back and saying thank you. But like volunteers in sport are just no. the best people oh, ever. There's no, no yeah. question about that. And yeah. the reality is that Olympic Games can't take place without volunteers, volunteers either. I volunteers know. run everything at the Olympic Games, you know, in, in every venue. They are just amazing. And yeah. uh, the joy that they give back, I suppose, because they love sport so much, is just brilliant to watch. Yeah, I know. I always wonder why they're not paid a few quid, given the amount of money swirling around the Olympic movement. But I guess you're, you're starting a whole new debate there, yeah, no, <laughs> which we don't have time for. We don't have time for. Sorry, but just before we go, one thing surprised me today, and it, it was only addressed in one of them, speaking of the Olympics, was the fact that Joe Ward uh, oh this yes, week saw, said that yeah. he was turning right, pro. I, and I just think that's a huge story, and I was really surprised yeah. that, um, I right think text, only, yes. um, I'm trying to remember which mail, I think it was. the mail is the only one mm. that has a piece on it, and I was really surprised, um, maybe, I know he did an interview with the local paper in Westmeath, and maybe he just wasn't available, but I think that's a huge, a huge Yeah, no, you're right, actually, that, that was one of those, I, I was flicking, like, and I saw I that, and I was just, thinking yeah. I'd see there might be an interview with him in the papers this weekend and I don't know why yeah. but maybe maybe he just wasn't available yeah
because he's a huge loss to um, amateur boxing yes. in Ireland. And also, you, how much of, of him uh, deciding now to go pro was the whole international uh, Olympics, the, uh, the international yeah, boxing problems yes. and its status in the Olympics, how much was that a factor? You sure, yeah. Know? But mm. what a talent. I mean, he, he's a brilliant talent. Is there a sense he's unfulfilled talent still? Yeah, I would have thought yeah. so. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, yeah, you would have thought that he would not. And he'd said it himself so many times. And he was an Irish senior champion so mm -hmm. young. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. beating Kenny, Kenny Egan, Egan when he was Any, 17. Exactly, yeah. Would you ever forget yeah. the yeah. strength of those punches? You yeah. know, he's probably uh, he's probably well suited. I don't know a lot about it, but he, he's probably, he had, he had, that punch, that mm. big punch that might be well suited to Brogan. Just that piece that I read see, indicates that the people that he's going to work with sound like they are good people. So yeah, yeah. they'll take care well, of themselves. That's half the battle, isn't it? It's a tough yeah. game. You don't sure know it's a tough boxing, game in pro boxing, yeah. 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 Okay, guys, thanks very much for that. Uh, real pleasure. Cleaning, thanks as ever for coming in. And Thank Michael you. Lester, it was good. You, you were free of a Sunday. Free to, of a Sunday. To wander in. It was great to have you in. Uh, we'll take a short break and then we'll check in with the two lads in Ennis and Thurlis in a moment. Facebook and Twitter. There's a smarter way to find your perfect 192 than following the crowd. Subtract all the noise that's out there. Then choose a reliable brand. Like one sculpted in Germany over 120 years. Filter the list for class-leading connectivity. Now select the one with the smartest choices around. Like 0% PCP or HP Finance. 3,000 euro scrappage or three years free servicing. Make the smart switch to Opel. Discover Corsa and Astra at our 120-year anniversary event. Now on at your Opel dealership. Opel. Born in Germany.